morning, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you to today's uh, discussion, today's further discussion titled Alternative Narratives to Illegal Migration Among Young People in Nigeria. I am Dr. Gloria Adneto, the Director of the Center of Excellence in Migration and Global Studies at the National Open University of Nigeria. I welcome you all to this uh, discussion. And I want to start by sending a special greetings from my Vice Chancellor, Professor Olufemi Peters, who is unavoidably absent due to other official commitments. But he sends his warm greetings to everyone. Our platform, like I said, is a platform called Center of Excellence in Migration and Global Study, is a fulcrum of research for migration. The center focuses on both internal and external migration and global studies. It was established in 2020 with a grant from TED Fund. And this center is the first of its kind in Nigeria. This is just a very brief uh, introduction for those who don't know much about the center. We have a website. We are very much into migration research and uh, the website will be displayed on the chat box shortly for anyone who wants to assess it. Today, this panel discussion is going to be with the CFDS and members of Chetnik Alumni Association of Nigeria, CAAN, British High Commission, and Chetnik Alumni Program Fund, CAPF. The Chetnik Alumni Program Fund uh, of the British High Commission had late last year supported CAAN to organize an essay competition on this topic for undergraduates in Nigerian universities. The topic is about uh, migration and copy migration. The essay competition was to generate ideas that would be helpful for CAAN engagement with stakeholders on curbing illegal migration and to challenge the youth on creating and harnessing opportunities in the local environment and to envision migration from the legal path. The winning essays have been published in a booklet and uh, a, 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 an e-copy of this booklet has been sent to us in this center. The panelists will discuss on the activities, especially on migration in Nigeria and how CNGS can pass on the view of youth on the subject. In the course of this discussion today, they will tell us more about themselves and their activities, especially in relation to migration, which is the focus of our center. Now, um, before I go further, let me display quickly our, um, let's display our agenda for today. So I will start to share my screen so that we can see the agenda before I go ahead to introduce the panelists. Oh, I go ahead to introduce the panelists. Please, can you see my screen? Is anybody seeing my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. So that is the, the agenda for today. But without most waste of time, I'd like to let us know that all the speakers seem to have one other activity or the other. So we are going to be very snappy about everything we are doing today. We are not going to spend more than 90 minutes. In fact, better below 90 minutes because they all want to go for other assignments. So because of that, everything will be quite orderly and time biased so that they can be able to meet their other important activities. So let me start by introducing, well, maybe um, 
Should I say, let me start with those that are here because the president, I don't think he's here yet. I wanted to start with him. Is anybody seeing him yet? I don't think he's he's, he is here. He has joined. He has joined. He has joined? Yes. Okay. So I'll fish him out soon. Anyway, let me go ahead. The president of this association, CAN, is Dr. Kesta O or Shaman here. And um, he's a graduate of mass communication from Enugu State University of Science and Technology, of Science Technology. He later went to the University of Ibadan and had a master's degree in managerial psychology. He started his career as a journalist working for the Guardian newspaper and Vanguard newspaper. He obtained the prestigious Joint Shedman Scholarship of Vodafone Foundation and the Foreign and Commonwealth for a master's degree at the University of Strathclyde, UK in 2008. He had his PhD from the University of Aberdeen in 2019. He combines his work with teaching at three different business schools in the UK, Italy and France. He has also worked in leadership roles in many companies. This is just a very, very brief bio data so that we don't take too much time for all this, knowing that we are all very busy people. And the vice president of this uh, association is Dr. Adeto Mustafa. She logged in very early, but said she had another meeting. I don't know if she has come back, but however, I'll go ahead and tell you about her in absentia. She's the vice president of Tegmin, Alumni Association of Nigeria, CAN, and Councillor for Africa in the International Society for Environmental Epidemiology Executive Council. She has a BSc and master, uh, master degree in microbiology from University of Lagos and Master of Public Health from University of Wales, Cardiff and PhD, Environmental Epidemiology, from Imperial College, London. She is a multi-skilled professional with about 30 years experience in health, safety, and environment, commercial transformation and leadership roles in the energy industry and the academia. She's a, lead, she's a leading environmental epidemiologist in Africa. She is an adjunct research fellow at the Nigeria Institute for medical research and an honor, honorary research associate in the Imperial College, London. She serves as energy efficiency consultant in Kyrgyzstan with the United Nations volunteers and as a trainer in Kenya with the UNESCO Health Watch Institute. She is engaged, engaged in international collaborations on global health and she is on the editorial board of international journals. She's a recipient of several national and international awards. So you can see that our speakers today are people with very distinguished uh, abilities. The next person I would like to introduce is Professor Abiodu Adeniyi, who had his first degree from the Amadou Bello University, Zaria, after which he worked for the Guardian newspapers a newspapers in Nigeria covering various bits in Lagos and Abuja for more than a decade. He won the British Chevening Scholarship in 2003 to study international communications at the University of Leeds, England, and began his PhD research immediately after his master's degree program at the same university in communication studies which he concluded in 2008. He has worked as communication consultant at World Bank Economic Reform and Governance Project at the Bureau of Public Procurement Presidency, Abuja, and Witswords Consults Limited, Abuja. He later joined Bayes University as a senior lecturer in mass communication and then as an associate professor. He has been visiting Professor of Communication and Multimedia Design at the American University of Nigeria, Yola, and an external examiner to many universities. He is a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Communication and Development. 
sorry that all these are very much abridged, but this is necessary for want of time. And finally, I'm going to introduce Mrs. Olufun Lajo, La Depo, because the, next, the last person is not around, so she's going to be the last to be introduced. She is um, not the least at all, but is a graduate of architecture from Amadou Bello University, Zaria. Completed her master's in 2001 and has since then worked in Abuja. She worked with a renovation company as project architect until she joined the British High Commission in April 2006. At the British High Commission, she worked with UKDR, that is a UK Business and Immigration, for 13 years and was a manager of a team for seven years. Out of the 13 years, she worked with DHC. In July of 2019, she joined the Jetsedning Network, where she has had the privilege of managing the selection process annually. Her most rewarding experience so far has been the opportunity to profile ideas on the best possible engagement strategy for Chevening alumni. I would say that with this uh, bio data, we are very much interested in what we have here today and we really thank this our group for coming to share with us and enlighten us about what they do, how they do it, and how we can be part of it. We welcome you all in a very special way. Without much waste of time, I will want to start from the very last person to uh, start off this discussion. And that is the person of, of Mrs. Lyo Vladepu to start off by telling us much about DXC and CAPF. We have known the meaning of these acronyms, British uh, High Commission and uh, the Chevney Association uh, Fund, uh, Program Fund, you know, that's CAPF. So we are going to hear from her now in the next five minutes. Let us hear from you, Mrs. Lyo Vladepu. Let me stop sharing. I have enabled all the participants to share their screen if they would want to do so. Thank you very much, Bye. Dr. Aneto, for that introduction. Um, I'm really, really very happy to be here. It's a great privilege to be here in your midst. Um, as you mentioned earlier on, my colleague Boma is unavoidably absent. Uh, she's away on an official assignment, so it's just me here today. And I am one of the two Chibnin scholarship officers in Nigeria, uh, and um, we, we both work in the British High Commission. So one of our main responsibilities as officers is first and foremost to manage the Chibnin program. Uh, this is a program that is available in over 160 countries in the world and funded by the Foreign Commonwealth Office. It is uh, for a one year master's program and it is to study any course at any UK university. It is aimed at potential leaders with great interpersonal skills and strong academic backgrounds. Another aspect about what we do is to manage our alumni engagement across Nigeria. And so far we have a network of over 1,300 alumni uh, and the, they are beneficiaries of the Chevening Scholarship Program. So this program sits under the British High Commission and it has, uh, we have the um, combined task of pursuing the UK's national interests and also projecting the UK as a force for good in the world. Uh, the British High Commission also promotes the interests of British citizens uh, safeguarding the UK's security, defending their values and reducing poverty um, in the world. So for the Chevening program, which you've touched on a little bit, one of the ways in which we encourage our alumni engagement is by supervising projects that are supported by a fund, which is called mm -hmm. the Chevening Alumni Program Fund, the CAPF. Last year, the Chevening Alumni Association of Nigeria, CAN, and the FCDO, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, uh, organized an essay competition 
which we titled Alternative Narratives to Illegal Migration. And I know that our President Kester and other alumni here present will do more justice to their participation in this essay in the course of this discussion. So usually what we do is we choose a project based on a theme. For example, reducing modern slavery, um, a theme probably like preventing illegal migration, education, governance and development, et cetera. So, I mean, there's so many themes we can choose from. So what happens is an, an, an alumnus or a group of alumni will then submit a bid to our head office in the secretariat, which is in the UK. And that bid must include the following. So the bid should be able to create positive change and contribute to UK foreign policy objectives. It must also be able to promote relationships between our alumni, hence the engagement. And finally, it should be able to strengthen the relationship we have between the Foreign Commonwealth Development Office, as well as the Chivnin Alumni Association of Nigeria. So all in all, CAPEF uh, uh, projects are, which are innovative, which boost participation um, between non-active alumni and also active alumni. In short, what we do is to encourage promotion of the Chivnin brand. So um, I'll put some links in the chat box after this, um, which will um, direct different people to our website, as well as the different um, links on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, where you can follow UK in Nigeria and find out what our priorities are. So um, I'll be happy to take on any questions later on, um, but for now I'll be handing back to Dr. Aneto. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, very, brief but concise and uh, uh, talk. I now want to call on the president, Dr. Kester, to kindly share with us, introduce us to, uh, to CAAN and talk about the essay competition. Doctor, you have 10 minutes to tell us. Thank you. I, uh, thank you very much. So you permit me to I uh, mute my video because I'm in a noisy environment and also trying to get over some domestic issues. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. and uh, Professor Neto. Uh, God bless you. We appreciate you and we appreciate your team for giving the Chivney Alumni Association of Nigeria the privilege today to introduce ourselves. So I'll start first and foremost by saying that the Chivney Alumni Association of Nigeria is made up of over 1,000 550 active members across the world. And presently in Nigeria, we have prominent people. You've just introduced two of them today. Uh, Dr. To Mustafa, who is the vice president of the association and an expert in her field in epidemiology who has done a whole lot of work around the world and has also bring Nigeria a lot of honor in her field. She's the vice president of the association, uh, Professor uh, Adeni, who just introduced some minutes ago, is the head of department, uh, mass communication, investor of uh, Bears University in Abuja, where he's also an author and also a researcher in public communication and communication for development is someone we are quite proud of, who has done us a lot of uh, good in Nigeria in his field. Uh, we have uh, Dr. John Momo, who is the chairman of Channel, Chairman CEO of Channels TV. We have um, Herbert Nguigwe of uh, the CEO, Group CEO of Access Bank. We have Amino Yagbola, who used to be in MTN and presently an expert in uh, law and uh, human resource management. She's a Shivnin uh, uh, you know, al al alumni member, and she's done so well in her field also. We have um, uh, Dr. Ade Duton, the immediate past CEO of First Bank. And um, many other Nigerians uh, who I can't begin to mention, Professor Meishi of uh, University of Edinburgh Business School, who presently is in the European uh, Central University, and many other people who had done so excellently well in their field. The Shivni Alumni Association of Nigeria is a distinctive association of people who had been given the scholarship to do their postgraduate uh, degree in the UK, master's degree in the UK, in the various universities across the UK. And each of them, after one year, comes back to Nigeria to contribute their quota towards the development of our nation. And uh, it's an association that is solely 
meant to project the socioeconomic development of, of our country. In my association, I am the, I'm privileged to be the president, but we have executive members, executive committee members and board of trustees. The board of trustees is headed by Dr. John Momo of Channel TV. We have uh, Malan uh, Garba Adamu. We have Amina Yagwala as a board of trustee member. We have Marcus Nomi as a, as a board of trustee member. We have Florence Iheme as a board of trustee member. And uh, with the constitution, Myself and the Secretary General are privileged to be uh, Mr. Femi Adedikwe, who is the Secretary General, and myself by the Constitution are meant are part of the Board of Trustees. So we actually contribute our quota to a different aspect of our nation. We decided to work with work stream, and we have economic work stream. We have a health work stream. We have a um, corporate social responsibility work stream. We have a uh, um, economic work stream. I mentioned that and information also uh, information and a, a cultural association work stream. So what we do is that when we work with this work stream, we look at projects and activity that actually lead to the development of our nation in the little way we can, because we are an association that solely survives based on our contribution, annual dues. We don't get donation from government or anywhere, but we work with the British High Commission, Lyo and the team, through the projects they have, particularly the CAPF that she just mentioned. And the last project we are quite proud of, which is part of the thing the team will be talking about today, is about the illegal immigration. From research and statistics across the nation, we discovered that Nigerian illegal migrants to Europe and America as at last year was in the neighborhood of about 2,450. That was the recorded number. And we can begin to put numbers to the people that died in the sea. So many of them died in illegal, uh, illegal detention center. So we work with the British High Commission through Shivni Alumni Project, uh, Program uh, Fund to say, let us shine some light in these issues. Let us bring them to the fore. And uh, Professor Adeni and his team looked at the essay submitted by undergraduates in Nigeria using various intellectual proprietary tools like uh, turn it in. Um, you know, checking the, the veracity and the originality of this essay, they this, this selected the, the winners. And it was a big and a huge event in Abuja uh, where awards were presented to them. I'll give that opportunity to Professor Adeni and um, Dr. Uh, Tom Mustafa to talk about it. But it was a project we are quite proud of because we, sh we were not only shining the light or bringing to the fore the challenges Nigerians go, go through, uh, um, through illegal migration route, some of them go to America, some of them go to Europe, some of them ended up in, in, in Libya. Some of them are into, modern, uh, they, they be a victim of modern, modern day slavery. So it was an opportunity to put all this into perspective. And uh, some of the fallout of that project was that a book was published. And, we are quite proud of the achievement. And the foreign and common, uh, FCDO, the com foreign and common world, uh, that's their, their partner, also publish it on their website. Those are some of the you know, high point of this project. We are quite proud of what we've achieved. And I will now yield the floor to you. Thank you so much for giving Thank me this you. opportunity to explain what we do. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for keeping to time. That was quite exact. Thank you so much. and. Um, we also want to now call on uh, Professor Adeniji, uh, who is going to talk to us on why youths migrate. Because the question is, why do youths migrate? So Professor Adeniji has 10 minutes to talk to us about this. Professor Adeniji, please. Over to you. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Quite a great privilege and um, uh, a greater privilege still to see my old professor, Sogudo, once more after a long while. And let me just also um, commiserate with the uh, president of uh, CAN, uh, Dr. Kester, who just spoke, who, who lost his father. I'm actually coming under the range of his voice after um, that incident. You know, um, long may, may God grant that. Um, may God grant Amen. His Amen. Amen. 
Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Yeah, sir. condolences, please. Okay. Um. First of all, let me commend the, the noun and uh, uh, C uh, P A led by Lyo and company for the good job they are doing. This, this is an opportunity for us to expose uh, what we've been doing, particularly with the question of um, migration. Yeah, I think we actually set out like the president said, just to raise awareness amongst the youth. You know, to review um with them. You know how well the understood migration and what more they can do, you know, to uh, think away from it. You know, what are the alternatives that they can find to um, illegal migration particularly? But I need to also put in context, you know, the question of semantic that arose severally between whether migration can be illegal or rather irregular. You know, it came up differently in circles, you know, but we settled marginally for the question of illegal, and, you know, because um, if you pervert the, if, you, if there's an infraction on the regulations of a particular country, somehow, although it may appear stronger, you know, it's an illegal thing, you know, going against the law is illegal, but of course, there are legitimate rules of migration, you know, which one would rather have explored and which we expect our youths um, um, to explore, of course, which uh, they sometimes largely uh, fail to comply with. And of course, nations have come to terms with this as an illegal kind of migration, even if a modern discourse around the question of migration often want to see it as rather illegitimate or irregular because they see it as a minor infra administrative infraction, you know, which um, is still a continuing debate, but of course, we just have to put it in context, you know, so that it will so look as if we are not cognizant of the context of um, the um, the terms as the case could be. And of course, we chose the youths, you know, because we are witnessing youth, youth budge. You know, Nigeria is predominantly um, a youthful country. Most of our population, the demographic is huge. And there are questions around increased integration of youths in governance. You know, and beyond that, of course, we have seen increased consciousness of youth you know, in the way in the way they participate or in the way they want to see the development, or rather in the way they ventilate, you know, as partly reflected in the answers question. You know, so all these issues are, are we're conflating where we talk about where we talk about uh, coming up with an essay that will focus on the youth question. And we, of course, we're looking at migration because there's a frenetic race, you know, a frenetic tendency to externalize hope on the part of um, the Nigerian youth. There's a mad rush to Canada, even as we talk. There's a, an increased rush to Europe, you know, more increased rush to, to the Americas. Many of them are going to Eastern Europe, you know. Um, some of them are not even, they don't even also mind even neighboring African countries, you know. And of course, if you permit them, if you ask them very deeply, there are sections of the Nigerian youth that won't even mind going to Afghanistan, you know, just to leave um, um, Nigeria, you know. So the obsession is just with traveling. And it, because it comes because they just believe that um, traveling, as the case could be, is synonymous with progress. So there's a historical doctrinal belief in the efficacy of traveling, irrespective of the dangers embedded in it. And of course, we see reports every day how they, how they, 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 um, how they die, and, you know, because Believe doctrinal belief that it is rather better to even die trying than not mm. to try at all. I will see how migration agencies, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, try to bring lots of them stuck in Libya back to Nigeria. But regrettably, as they are being brought back, a lot of them are still trying to exit. They are still trying, believing in different kinds of powers that they can use, believing that because one or two of them succeeded, they, they too can also um, succeed, you know, and uh, because they just believe that it's a matter of luck, it doesn't matter whether they die in the process, you know, the greater sin would be not to try at all. Trying, mat trying is very, very important. You know, so, so it was against all that background that we came up with that essay, and we saw all these sentiments reflected in the submissions of the ent entrance. So basically, ladies and gentlemen, it's very clear for us to know um, why migration is prevalent among the youth, because, you know, they are simply externalizing their hope. You know, they live in a state of hopelessness. They do no, no longer see a, a, um, hope in, a, in the Nigerian system arising from overpopulation over the years. There has been consistent or um, persistent increase in our population with limited resources. 
we can't cope, you know. And of course, there's also the regrettable part of bad governance, poor leadership, you know, you know prebendal rapacity of those who are in who, who are in government, you know, and obvious luxuriation in the midst of poverty, and of course, lead lead lip service services to the wishes and aspirations of the people. You know, we'll do, we publicly see government officials, you know, mounting prosperity, talking about growth and development, but in actual practical terms, you know, they do little to actualize this. And of course, the youth are sensitive to this. They are doing this every day, so they cannot place their hope on any uh, platform at all, other than looking elsewhere. Those of them who are not from rich, privileged homes hardly can get job in, um, in lucrative public agencies, you know. Of course, we know those ones. Those ones recruit nearly every year, but it's done through all kinds of underhand, you know, behind the scene uh, processes, you know, sh excluding, shutting out a lot other of them who are qualified, you know, just because, but because they are not connected, they are not, they are not privileged, you know, um, they cannot be had, let alone having the opportunity of being engaged. So where else would they look at? Of course, they are looking outside. All these things were reflected in their submission. And of course, um, of increase in crime affecting everybody, even the elders are scared of tomorrow, you know, and when the elders worry, they worry more about the future of their children, you know, growing up in this system. And of course, these youths have become really sophisticated. You know, they are between the ages of 18 and, 20, and 30, 35, they have become very, very sophisticated. They are alive to the downside of the system. And they are believing that, look, this is not a place to be. In a situation where elders are fearful, how, what else do we think of the young ones? So they reflected all this. And of course, the, the future, the future to them is just bleak. What more would they do if not to look outside? It has resulted into uh, this state of diehardness, you know, about, about exiting, you know, about emigration. And of course, we know this immigration eventually leads to um, the rise of migrant diaspora community, which we are even still struggling uh, to have. But I believe that's a question for another day. But essentially, I'm sure at some point you are seeking to call me back to tell you um, what, is today, what, the, what the entrance actually, um, what they actually thought with respect to viewpoints from the migration. But this is a harmony, as it, as the case could be, of all the thoughts that were gathered, you know, um, from the youths in the competition. And on that note, I will say thank you for your attention. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This is great. Everybody is so time conscious. I like that. We are getting it right. Thank you so much. And now I will call on a Dr. Adito Mustafa, who will also tell us what are, about the possible ways to curb illegal migration. So, Dr. Tom, please, can we hear from you? You have five minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and I want to stand on the protocol already established by the previous speakers, and thank for having us in here. I think we we'll first of all need to come to the reality of the scale of the problem we have at hand. The United Nations Population Projection of 2020 actually puts Nigerian population at 206 million and projected to become to double by year 2050. And currently 43% of Nigerians are between are less than ages of 14. While we have about 63% of our population less than the age of 25 years. The median age in Nigeria is about 18 years which is even lower than the median age for Africa which comes to around 20 years and the median age for the rest of the world, which comes to around 29. So essentially, Nigeria is a youthful nation. And we really need to begin to look at that. Imagine 43% of your population that are under 14 years. In the next 10 years, they will be 24. They'll be in their early 20s. And they will need employment. So how do we call illegal immigration? Professor Deneyi has done good justice to what the drivers of illegal immigration are. And he raised a salient point, which is about poverty and opportunities. What are the opportunities? And these are the drivers we actually need to look at and address before we can call illegal immigration. To be honest with you, migration has been an ancient bold step that people take. 
and there is nothing wrong with it. It is so important that 18th of December every year is designated as World Migration Day. And it is recognized globally that migrants contribute their knowledge, their skills for the betterment of the society where they live. So migration itself, it's nothing wrong. It is a welcome, it is a dynamic thing that happens in the environment. But what we need to look at in this discussion today is why are Nigerian youths actually endangering their lives to go the illegal route? And like I, uh, uh, Professor Deneye has said, one of the major issues is poverty. Whether childhood poverty or even poverty by their parents and the limited opportunities. When you look at our education system, People will migrate for various reasons. One would be that when I get to somewhere else, I will have a better education. How many have went to a public school throughout? But I'm, for my primary and secondary school, even my university were public schools, you could say on scholarship, but how many people can afford to put their children? How many children of you and I on this call can afford to put our children in the Ibado City Council primary school I went to. <laughs> Many of us will not. Why? Because we know the quality is not as good as what we benefited from. So I think we need to address, if we want to call illegal immigration, we actually need to look at the drivers of illegal immigration and begin to address them. We need to be, make sure that our public education is competitive and attractive enough for people to want to send their children. And it is not a brain surgery. I lived in Port Harcourt a long time. There was a time during one of the one, one, one governor, ex-governor, that public schools, public primary and secondary school were revamped in River State. People were actually withdrawing their children from some, from some public, uh, private school to such school. So we can do that. The other one is opportunities, alternative opportunities to hand living are not very prominent for youth. The only thing people know about is, at least if I get to somewhere else outside Nigeria, I will be able to earn a living and have a decent average living. I think we have not done enough to let people understand that despite all the challenges we have, we have ample opportunity to succeed in Nigeria. There are lots of empowerment that will happen. I mean, a population of 200, imagine the markets that we have. Imagine the markets we have. And that is one thing other people see in Nigeria and they come to invest in Nigeria and do things. We need to start reorientating our mind to saying that once you go to a university, the next thing you need to do is to get employment in the civil service or in the academia or white collar job. We need to let people realize that there are lots of other things people can do. And please permit me to share my life experience. I did not start working like this. Nigeria has always been a challenging place to be. Even when I graduated in 1990, it was difficult to know what to, it is difficult to know where to start from. But what do I do? I did not start by working in my energy sector. There are other things I had to do, skills I have to cultivate entrepreneurial skills that have to put, but with resilience and persistence, why earning income, teaching in various schools, teaching in lessons, looking for better opportunities, I grading my skills, being a PhD, being a master's, getting certification. I became so competitive and I was able to get the employment, but I did not start in that employment. I think we need to do more to help youth to have intergenerational conversation, to be able to realize that there are other things people can do within in the short term to equip themselves. Because even where they are going to, if they don't have the requisite skills and knowledge, they are not going to be better off. And I, I want to tell you that that is one thing Khan has been doing. The essence of even the essay competition is to create an intergenerational conversation for people to know that People like Professor Adenihi, people like me, people like Dr. Esther, and I mean, Ayakbala, Dr. John Mama, we all have opportunity to study abroad. But we did not use that to help 
and say we are not coming back. We took the skills and the knowledge to come back to Nigeria. And it was not for many of us. We did not even have a job. Many did not have a job waiting for them. But we felt that we could contribute. We look for where there is a problem and profile solution. And because we are solution creators, we generate creator and we had value. We are able to make a headway in life. And for me, COVID illegal immigration will be actually addressing the drivers of immigration, illegal immigration, and having intergenerational conversation and opening the eyes of the youth to alternatives that are prevalent in our local environment. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I am very happy for what we are hearing. And uh, I hope uh, as many parents are also listening uh, because these, uh, these issues, we all have hands in it. Now that uh, we have heard from the panelists, I think everybody has spoken. We still go on to the next part. Professor Adini is coming up again to tell us the viewpoints from the winning essay and the CAPF essay booklet. You know, just tell us about it for five minutes. Thank you, Professor Adini. You, are, you have the virtual space. Okay, uh, thank you very much once more. And I appreciate my colleague, uh, Dr. Um, Tong, you know, for that brilliant submission, because I remember we worked um, very closely in the tip of um, the essay competition. And of course, there were so many deductions, you know, that we made, you know, um, from the essays that we got, nearly about, about 2,000 of them. It was very Herculean, like President Kester said, sitting um, through them. Of course, we used Tonitin, we used a different plagiarism check as well, just to be sure that the essays were original and that the students were true to type. You know, they were very, some of them were very creative, very industrious people. But central to the argument was that migration is not necessarily an end in itself, but it's not necessarily an end in itself. It's not, it, 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 it ordinarily does not come to them as, as a factor of passion. You know, that it's coming from, for them essentially because of economics. And of course, if, even if there are other factors that the canvas has risen for migration, central to it, the bottom line at the end of the day is often economics. You know, of course, some of them will say they are seeking further educational opportunities. They want to go and do masters. They want to go and do one short course or the other. It's just a story, a kind of narrative, you know, to escape into um, uh, foreign countries. At the end of the day, they will find no reason, have no reason uh, to come back. Some of them hardly talk about tourist, tourist visa because they do know that it's not going to come, you know, it's very difficult to get if they are not privileged because they don't have fat bank, bank accounts. You know, and of course, um, this visa issuing for uh, um, authorities for destination countries are aware of the antics of the desperate migrants. They know that some of these documents can be forged. So on both sides, they are all aware of the antics of the of the tricks, you know. So um, the youths are now concerned about, you know, coming in the guise of going for further studies. And of course, the, if they are not going for further studies, this one happens among the ones who are a little more enlightened, a little more conscious, who have uh, far, who still have some elevated sense of the self. You know, they still realize their worth, you know, and are not able to die trying ordinarily like the uh, the other ones who go through the Sahel and the Mediterranean. You know, so they just believe that education will be a route with, through which they can explore the migration option. And they are asking that, well, if they have hope within the land, if the system can give them hope, they have no reason to leave their country. Is there a way, for instance, that some of the the, the benefits that they are, that people natives in foreign countries in prosperous uh, foreign countries are enjoying is there a way some of their benefits can be enjoyed here even if not up to that level but at least some level of hope so that they too can become human beings they can feel a sense of fulfillment after educa their education basic education or otherwise they can get married live a regular life regular family life you know have children you know, have some basic sense of fulfillment. This sense of fulfillment is what they are arguing has been denied them in this country of theirs, you know. And they're also concerned about them 
obvious luxuration on the part of uh, leaders. Leaders say one thing and they do the other thing year in, year out. Uh, frustration uh, from fighting corruption, that we've been hearing corruption from the late 60s. We'll be hearing questions of anti-corruption or corruption from the late 60s. And many decades afterwards, it's still a canker worm that we can't still deal with. You know, why is it nagging? Why can't we deal with it? The question remains at the doorstep of leadership that are that are probably not committed, you know, uh, to the fight against corruption. We realize it how systemic and how endemic it has become and how, how it has eaten deep into our into our very fabric and preventing the development of can enjoy, but even generations that will come long after them. So overall, um, the wish for good leadership, um, the wish for stability of the system, the wish for prosperity for their land, as such that they will not have to risk their life going abroad. And because fundamental to every migration, and I think like, don't, finally on this note, Dr. Tom may make, make that point, when an age of globalization, you know, where there's the world has become largely decentered. There's movement, cross movement of people. So if migration is okay, if it is legitimate, movement is okay if it is legitimate. But when it becomes irregular, when it becomes illegitimate, it becomes problematic. Why? Why is our, our own youth? Why are they involved in the illegitimate, the irregular, irregular one? Of course, because of some avoidable internal contradictions reflected around our poor or palace economy. So can we rectify that through good leadership? That's a question the, the youths are having. Once this can be achieved, even when they, if they see semblances of it, of course, they will think away uh, from migration. That's the, my submission, ma. Thank you once more for the opportunity. Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful submission. I seem to fall in love with all the points raised there. And then um, I will also now call Dr. Tom back to come and wrap it up anything to add let us say from you ma'am and these viewpoints from the essay and the capf essay booklets i think one thing be like a, a he said we had one thousand for this essay and it was interesting going through many of those essay after we prone them to around the 500 and then being able to get the top seven that were ranked by cross function, uh, cross um, discipline team. And one of the things that everybody agrees on, the views of the youth on what we can do to curb illegal immigration were interesting. And I hope that we all as adults and policymakers and leaders and parents will listen to it. One of it was as simple as letting people know the realities, the living realities of the countries where many of Nigerian youths want to go. There is a tendency to proclaim maybe uh, the OECD countries as a place where it is so easy for you to pick, uh, to make it in life. And you just go in there, everybody is free. Nobody tells you about the almost 40% tax you will pay on your earnings in Canada, 45% tax. Nobody tells you that the number of paid holiday you will have in the US is not your 30 day working days or 24 weeks that you have in Nigeria. The living realities in the UK, nobody tells you that you pay for everything that you earn, that all your bills go on pay, all your earning goes on bills and that if you don't have the necessary papers, life will be miserable for you. So the living realities in those countries, people are not looking at it. And being able to let people realize that even for those of us that are Chevron Scholar, we have some people in our sets. Maybe they are not Chevron Scholar, maybe they were in the school, but decided to stay back. When you look at their lifestyle, are they significant 20 years down the line, 50, are they significantly different from ours? Are we better off? We need to paint the picture of reality about some of these countries so that people will know. And please permit me to also let people realize there is a study and that that uh, African Union has shown that actually 63% of migration in Africa happened within Africa, sub-Saharan Africa. 
people actually move into other African countries within Sub-Saharan Africa. So it is only 1.5% of Africans sub from Sub-Saharan sub Africa that are actually living in Europe, within the European Union. It is just because the press has made this so much loud noise, the one-sided story that it makes it seem. So even mig migration within African countries are much more than what we have to EOECD country. And we need to begin to look at that. How do we treat each other as Africans migrating, living in Ghana? Living in Ghana? Or how do we, Nigerians living in South Africa, how do we behave? How receptive are we to each other? The reality, the last time that was in the news, that about 4 million Ghanaians are living in Nigeria. So I think we also need to begin to address this. And the youth are also bringing in this in their study. And the other one is about, they are saying it is very difficult to be self-employed. You will need to generate your own water. You will need to pay multiple taxation. I think we need to address and empower SME. There are people, there are youth who want to go into this sphere, but our system and our environment make it difficult for people to say, I have a business, I want to start a business of my own. It is difficult. The information to even do it, even in our university, our curriculum does not train people on entrepreneurial skills. We are graduating people to go into the job market, the jobs that are not there. So we need to begin to look at, do we give people exposure on what they can do? And entrepreneurial skills is not only limited to people in, in particular field, even in science. There are many things we are doing that we can commercialize. So commercial acumen, Commercial skills have to be part of our training curriculum, even at undergraduate level. And last but not the least is about letting people know that legal migration could be beneficial to a country. I give you an instance. There were countries that actually conduct technical certification for their non-skilled manpowers, for them to be able to go to Dubai to work in the construction industry. There is nothing wrong with that, I can tell you that. So if you have enough people, Nigeria is not going to be able to, to provide jobs for all its graduates. Why don't we use diplomatic means to actually ensure that we can actually encourage our people to also add value elsewhere? Open it up, train more people than you need, whether be doctors, or what have you? The Nigerian diaspora, they are contributing a lot of money, returning money back. A country like India benefits a lot from money people are sending back home by their citizens who are working elsewhere. We can train more people than we need locally, and then let our people know they can go outside. We can do as, as we have now. It is a reality that Nigeria cannot provide jobs for all the graduates. So we need to rethink how we make it migration. We come to reality that it is a healthy thing, it is, but, and there are opportunities to do it and let people know about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tom Mustafa, for that uh, beautiful submission. Um, very thrilled by what I have heard here today. And I think we are really uh, putting a round hole, a round peg into a round hole, because really getting to the point, the main reasons why youth migrate, not only youth, even adults, <laughs> everybody is migrating. And like we have said, Nigerians, we all want to migrate because we feel our country is not a, it's not a, a comfortable place. I really want to, before I go into uh, rounding up or asking questions before rounding up, I want to say many very salient points have been raised here today. Why youth migrate? And I'm sure we all heard. And possible ways to curb this youth migration. These are very, very germane and relevant to us in National Open University of Nigeria and to this center 
of uh, excellence in migration and global study. I want to quickly point out that here, here and now, we are very much involved in entrepreneurial study, uh, skills acquisition for our own students. So it's a very big one in, in this university. So I, I give kudos to my university for promoting this. Well, having said that, I will quickly want to open this uh, uh, session for questions and answers and comments. We've listened to, this, uh, to the panelists. We have heard their points of view. We have uh, heard what they do. So it's time now to ask questions. But perhaps I, set, I want to set the ball rolling. Um, while I listened carefully, I don't think I heard from any of the speakers how to be an alumnus. <laughs> they are all alumni. How, what they did that they became one, we don't know. Is it because they were sponsored to go and train by this uh, 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 chef That's why they became, they should throw more life. Because I can stand up now and say, I want to be one. And I don't know whether I'm qualified. That's one. I also want to, of course, they've been able to tell us alternative to migration is to have entrepreneurial skills, uh, but uh, <laughs> I want us to look at that more again, because we have seen that there are drivers like you have rightly identified, especially uh, Dr. Otto, you identify drivers and uh, governance is a major one. You will agree with me that in your time or in my time, perhaps this country was a bit better. So the youth are getting more and more frustrated because of what they are seeing. So a word for the government, perhaps, let's see what we can do to make them see, apart from counseling them. Professor Dini has said it. What they, look, what they want at home is not there. So they are ready to take risks. If they like, they die. They don't care. I'll, I'll go and die somewhere else. Perhaps it's as bad as this. Then I also want to, of course, ask, CMGS, like I have told you at the beginning, we are a center uh, established by Teton for, on migration and global studies. We want to know how can we collaborate? We are an ODS system. How can we collaborate with these beautiful and laudable activities that you have in this Chevney and the others? Then I also want to ask this essay, this wonderful essay that these students have been able to put their thoughts together, that you have been able to assess and winners have a match, a beautiful one. I want to ask specifically, is it for university students or secondary school students? What level of students really took part in this essay? Having said that, I want to give you room for others to also put in their questions while the individuals who are going to give answers I'm noting them, and I will call the speakers one after the other to respond as necessary. So perhaps we just wait to collect the questions. Or do you want to answer them one by one? But for want of time, you better to collect all the questions and then you answer at once. Dr. Tom, what do you think in answering these questions? Do you want to get all let's, the questions then? Let's have all the questions. Before? Let's have all the questions. Yes, it's better, it's better. Thank you. So please, I can see hands up. Let me call on our Emeritus Professor Sogolu. Uh, father, who is always doing us proud. Your turn, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Netu. First of all, I want to express my appreciation to the Center of Excellence for Migration for always uh, connecting us with great uh, minds. Uh, Dr. Abiodu uh, uh, Adeni is, uh, is a friend. No, I've not met him for some time now, and. Uh, this has given me the opportunity of, uh, of, of, of hearing him. And uh, in fact, a friend uh, gave me his number. Uh, uh, so I think it was uh, Abraham Obudu. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then I misplaced it. But now I know I can reconnect with him. I, I've given him um, at the, the office opposite uh, Go. Now I told you, please, we must meet. So I thank you very much for that. And uh, but on this subject uh, we are discussing, I think migration itself is a natural movement between nations and so forth. What we are emphasizing is the legal aspect of migration. And uh, much of it is really 
uh, caused by misconceptions of, of, of the other place where young people want to go to. They have a lot of uh, mistaken uh, impression about that. And sometimes their parents do not help matters. Uh, I will recall that uh, when I, as a young lecturer, I was always keen on getting the green card, going to the US and so forth. And uh, you know, it turned out, you know, I married uh, an American, but that was not the reason I married the American. But and then I, I got the green card. But when I stayed in the US for six months and so forth, I just felt it wasn't a place for me. So I had to return. And people were asking me, why are you not going back to the US? And I said, no, because I did, I couldn't. And then, of course, my, my family, my wife, my children are in the UK currently. But I don't feel like living in the UK. So, but the point I'm trying to make is that at a certain age, the kind of impression which our youth have about you know, developed countries and so forth is, is bound to happen. And what we need is proper education. You see, uh, there was a, a, a family friend who, because he lacks you know, education, used to tell the children that, uh, look, going to the UK is better than you know, getting a wife or getting, but you have to wait your time. Once you cross into the UK, you're all right. And, and I thought we need education, better education. Uh, otherwise, there's no way you will prevent younger people from having that impression that is better outside than here. And also, one of the major things that uh, 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 Professor Daniel always emphasized, you must make your own country better so that you know, the youth will feel like staying rather than dreaming about some other land. I thank you very much, uh, the Center of Excellence, Dr. Aneto, for this opportunity of meeting thank this you, great sir. mind. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Professor Devi, we must meet. <laughs> thank you, sir. Now thank I can you. see yes, the yes, talk. Yes, Prof, I'm going to sir. <laughs> thank, thank you, you very much for that uh, thank you. wonderful contribution, sir. Dr. Thank Elume Luluka has been raising his hand, so can we give you the virtual space, sir, to have your comments? Are you there? Yes, um, yes I'm, I'm here. I just put, yeah. put up the camera. I, yes. I want to thank you for this program. This information was given to me a few minutes ago by a colleague of mine from the Court of Justice. I am the head of the Vision for Migration and Border Management at the Equals Commission, and also the director for private sector. And um, as I speak, I'm in Niger, uh, where we organize startups programs for our youth. Mm -hmm. We've been able to pitch 75 um, youth from member states, five each mm -hmm. from member states. Um, I just want to like, um, I won't take your time because I was not invited. So I just want to brief. You see, migration, like was mentioned here, is our way of life. And that is why in ECOWAS, the first protocol that came into being was mobility of persons, goods and services. That's the protocol of freedom of persons, right of entry, residence and establishment. Beyond that one, they had additional texts in terms of addressing mobility outside the region. And that's why we see regular and irregular migration, not illegal migration. This document also outlined a broad spectrum of intervention in terms of migration management. That's the ECOWAS common approach on migration, which was adopted in 2008. Excellencies, the documents also develop actions. The actions are in six areas of intervention. There's free movement, all actions to encourage regular migration, all action to, to combat irregular migration, all action to, to mainstream gender. Then you have the actions to um, address issues of, of um, crime, I mean, um, asylum and refugees, but it was not comprehensive enough. So based on that one, the issues, emerging issues like climate change came, in, came on board. And now as we speak, we have a regional migration policy. 
So when you talk about migration, migration should not be discouraged. And also, we should also we make it clear, clear distinction, because that's why we have a particular column addressing mismigration. Each type of migration should be treated different way. So I don't want to take your time, but I just like, um, I could like um, also engage with you in some other time, but we also have water management, integrated water management. We will also be able to develop the biometric ID card, just like you mentioned, 80% of people moving within our region are moving within. Then this starts up we're doing, connecting people, knowledge of the, of the region is very important. But I know that I have no time here. So whenever, whenever I'm ready to like engage with your institution, I, like I do with Ghana University, I'm sure they have, you know, they have the same migration institution in, I mean, in, in, the, in Lego University. And I go there to, to, to talk about it. I mean, Nigerian too. So Madam, I, I'm very happy. If you look at me, I'm on the way, I had to stop. I said, yeah. I'm on spot on this. So I'll be very grateful to, I'll be back like tomorrow, engage with you and discuss with your students on migration. It is yeah. a way of life. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. Please, before you, I don't want to, I don't want to miss you. Can you drop your phone or the chat box, please? So that I contact you. Please do. Okay. Okay, Thank madam. You. And I'm a retired control of immigration. So from there, I moved on to. Yeah, yeah. so can you just drop your phone. Drop your phone. I'll do that I'll right now. You. Thank you so much. I'll do that right now. Yes. Thank you. So, uh, doctor, just, sorry, uh, Dr. Aneto, just before Mr. Elumelu. Elumelu, Elumelu. Elumelu. The drop off, please. I just sent you a private chat too. If you can send us your contact details, email yes. address, and WhatsApp, uh, everything. He, I, I'll do that right now. Yes, please send what it. Put it in the also to engage people like you so that mm -hmm. you can amplify the voices of the youth. Yes, yes. thank you, very thank you much. so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, yeah, I uh, let me look at it quickly. I don't think I can see any hand up. Maybe you just answer these questions. Maybe. The, from the answers, we may have more questions or clarifications. So let's take the ones we have heard. Three of us have spoken. Please, can we start from, let's start from um, the president. Is he still around? Is the president still there? Let's see him. Okay, if the president is not there, so let's start, Prof uh, Dr. Tong, the vice president. Over okay, to you, so ma'am. Okay, so let me address how to join Khan. Yes, Khan <laughs> is a group of alumni who have won the British Army Scholarship okay. or Fellowship. Okay. Okay. So when you come back, you are an automatic member when you come okay. back. Okay. And how to join, how to, you can get more details about British Army. Uh, my colleague here, Mrs. Oladepo, has already posted on the tax box more how you can get more information on shevening www.shevening.org and also navigate to know more about it so we we'll welcome more youth it is a prestigious scholarship as you have seen the how the presidents listed it most of the people that you will find in making impact in nigeria at one time benefited from such scholarship so we we'll welcome more youth it's always attracts thousands of application every year. And I think uh, very soon, another advert will go so people can do that. So once you are back, you are part of us. I think I've answered that. The next- no, Sorry, we were saying whether it's secondary or university, that angle we want to hear. How old is it? The, the uh, it's a postgraduate master's level, the level, master's level. The essay, the essay. The essay is for university undergraduates. Okay. The CAF I said done last year was for university undergraduates. That is that. I think two of the questions have gone. There is one question of how now can they collaborate with us? Yes. Okay, so once we know, and that is what we have kick starts this to break the heist, to let you know that we exist and we are doing some work on migration. And what we'll be looking at if there's any area where implementation of some of the things that the youth have said that we can work together to make it a reality, we'll be interested in that. And like you can also see, just like Mr. Numenu have said, we also are interested, many of us like Professor Biodun and myself, we also, even Dr. Kester, 
one of the key things can does is mentorship. So if you have an event that involves talking to students, talking to young people, I can tell you, can will be interested in that. And when we are doing activities that we know align with your, your vision, we will also be willing to do that. But this is just to kick off the conversation. We will have a more detailed information on what our activities are and area of interest. That's where we can both collaborate. And I, the same, I think, will, uh, applies to the British High Commission. We will need to be able to engage them to also know what are their priorities and how do you fit into that, and we can pick it up from there. Okay. I think those are the questions I could pick. I don't know if I miss anyone that Professor Deneyi might want to address or had to. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think you practically covered everything, Doc. Uh, you practically covered everything because most of the questions bothered on um, administration, you know, of um, our processes, and you you dealt with them. And of course, I've just to add that uh, the um, personal experience of what of uh, Professor Sogolo um, to Professor Emeritus, that is, you know, to my migra his migration experience. You know, it's always very instructive, you know, and in this business of migration and diasporization, most of the time we we'll like leverage on personal individual experiences, you know, to illustrate cases, you know, um, like examples of why people um, should either migrate or not migrate. So because there are different experiences, I will always make the point that it's often like, a, like marriage. There's no, there are no two marriages that can be the same thing. They always have, they are always very unique, you know, have their own specificity, you know. So it takes the ingenuity of the parties involved in the relationship to devise ways of cohabitation, you know. So, and that's how migration is. To yes, most of the time it may be um, it may be inappropriate for one person, but it can be appropriate um, for the other person. But if you look at it on the scale of one to two, one to ten, how many people have actually had very good tale about? Um, migrating um, illegitimately and legitimizing it at the end of the day and making a success out of it. How many? On the scale of one to 10, you know, you just find that this, the, 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 the number is on the wrong side of, of that scale as the case could be. So overall, I think it's very, it's been pleasurable exchanging thoughts with you. I will thank you for identifying us. You know, like my bosses have said, the president and the vice president, we're always there to uh, support you. You know, we are partners in progress, definitely in the, in the field of intellectual and ideation. And we always um, look forward to meeting you anytime uh, possible. But for me, I'm going to meet Professor Sogolo this week in his office. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. And um, uh, I admire the reunion. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank, you, Thank you so much. Um, uh, I don't think I can see any hand up. Anybody else wanting to make any clarifications? But since we have your contact details, we are okay. And uh, we surely build on this start. We build on this uh, takeoff uh, by God's grace. I really want to say we have had a very nice, uh, this is just about uh, 70 minutes that we've been here now and that's it, it's so fast. And I'm sure Dr. Otto is happy because she has been worried about time. And I told her we have no problem, things will go well. And thank God everything has gone well. We appreciate all the panelists. It's been wonderful meeting you and thank you for sharing with us. And then um, we thank all our guests for coming here to listen to them and contributing. We really appreciate uh, Dr. Elumelu, even though he said he was not invited, it's an open invitation. This platform is an open invitation. You can be sure that some people are here from US, from Canada. So anybody who wants to learn, this is a platform for anybody who wants to learn. We have no restrictions. So we welcome you at any time and we we'll surely get in touch with you, Dr. Edumelu. And I really want to say a big thank you once again. This center appreciates you all. We are looking forward to getting the hard copy of that book. I know the e-copy has been sent to my mail by uh, Mrs. Lyo, 
But I want the hard copy. So, Doctor Adetong, you can please drop it at Ibadan if you cannot drop it at Abuja. <laughs> I'm in Abuja. I'm in Abuja, National Open University. If you cannot drop it here in Abuja, at least she knows where to drop it in Ibadan. I know she knows. <laughs> Thank you so much for um, being with you. We really appreciate you. God bless you. And in summary, that we have been able to learn that they have an essay competition on annual basis where they select people who merit to win, to win. We, it goes through a strict selection. So we are looking forward to that essay when it's open again. We may be interested. We may get somebody who is interested to be part of it. And we really thank you for enlightening us on why youth migrate and some ways to curb youth migration. And uh, on that note, I want to say a big thank you to you and have a very wonderful day. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you thank and you. God bless.